began working in Ethiopia uh, as a young scholar in 1970, uh, when I was invited to work there by my advisor uh, at the University of Chicago, Professor Clark Cowell, who uh, died just a few years ago when he was a professor at uh, University of California at Berkeley. And um, it was really, for me, a, a childhood dream uh, come true to get to Africa. Um, people uh, asked at dinner, you know, where, how did I get interested in something like this? I grew up in Connecticut, um, and as a young boy, I had occasion to meet an anthropologist. Uh, he was studying social cultural anthropology, uh, as you heard in the wonderful introduction, I'm a paleoanthropologist. There was somebody on the little airplane flying here today. He asked me what I did, and I told him I was a paleoanthropologist, and he kind of mused for a second. He said, oh, does that mean you study old anthropologists? <laughs> so I told him it was human origins, um, just a fancy word for human origins. but. Um, I think it's important, there are so many students here this evening that I want to say a few words uh, about how um, a, a young, as a young kid I, I got interested in anthropology. I met an anthropologist when I was around nine years old. Uh, he was teaching uh, at a small institution in Connecticut and um, I used to take care of his dog when he went off to Africa and uh, he allowed me to wander through his library and uh, look at whatever I wanted to look at. And there were very few books in my home. Uh, I'm the son of uh, Swedish immigrants uh, who migrated to the United States in the early, it sounds like ancient history, which it is, in 1920, which is a long time ago, almost a century ago, how unbelievable that is. And uh, my mom and dad came to the United States uh, to seek a new land of opportunity, uh, which of course is our great United States of America. And my dad was a barber, he passed away unfortunately when I was two years old, so I never really knew him. And we moved at a young age to Connecticut to be with my mother's sister and brother who had also immigrated to the United States, and I met this anthropologist. And so there were very few books in, in my house. Uh, no one had gone on to college. Most people in my immediate family didn't even finish high school. And uh, this was a fortuitous meeting for me because I became galvanized by the idea that human beings actually had some kind of a very, very ancient paleo history. And I recall as a young boy uh, perusing his library and being impressed particularly by a book called Man's Place in Nature by Thomas Henry Huxley. And I will say a few words about this when uh, we begin to look at some slides, some pictures. And uh, I became intrigued with the idea that human beings were part of the continuum of life on the planet. That the same process which has brought about all life on the planet, the process that of course, Darwin articulated most eloquently in 1859 in his Origin of Species, and that we belonged here as much as any other species belongs on this planet, that we had gotten here through the same process of evolutionary change, that all life on the planet has gotten here through. But most exciting for a 13-year-old kid reading that book were these pictures of chimp and gorilla skulls, because while they appear to be somewhat different. Chimps have very projecting faces and small brains. We tend to have very flat faces and big brains. That the general outline of the skeleton, we have 206 bones in our body, last I checked, and uh, chimpanzees and gorillas have the same number of bones. And Huxley and Darwin made an extraordinary prediction that Africa would be the place where we would find our ancestors because our closest living relatives are there today, chimps and gorillas. And uh, I, I was deeply intrigued by this idea. I decided as a young teenager that uh, I wanted to go to Africa like my sort of surrogate father, had, where he had worked most of his life. And when I was 16 years old, 
he brought me an article from the New York Times uh, newspaper uh, about a discovery of a skull in Eastern Africa, in what is today Tanzania. I think it was Tanganyika in those days. And it was a skull that was uh, recovered by the late Lewis and Mary Leakey called Zingentropus, or Nutcracker Man. And at 16 years old, so now you all know how old I am, um, I decided that I wanted to go to Africa and find something. And um, this was a pretty bold statement by uh, a teenager. It was one of the things that as I look back on and look at the books that are, I still have from that age, that it was a childhood dream. It was something that I really wanted to do. It was something I really wanted to pursue in spite of the fact that no one in my family had ever gone to college, mine, graduate school, and so forth and so on. And for the students in the room, I'd just like to say that it really is important for each and every one of you, as it was for me, I think, to have some idea of what it is you'd like to do. The earlier you decide on this, the better you are. But we all need to harbor a dream, some sort of passion that will guide us uh, through this torturous journey that we call life. As I have found out, as have most adults here, is one of my favorite expressions, the road to success is always under construction. And it is not easy always to achieve our goals. But it allows us to focus on uh, some particular endpoint and some particular goal. We may not all be as fortunate as uh, others, but we have something that remains very special to ourselves. And I think that uh, that's an important message for students who may be first generation as I was, uh, college students, uh, or the first in their family to go to university or college. And I know here at Porterville from talking to people today that it is an extraordinary place, a good place, to get a firm, solid educational underpinning that will allow you to do things that you might not think are imaginable at the moment. The other thing about having an interest and a passion in life is that you may not end up getting that Nobel Prize in physics or cosmology or something, but you have something in, on the intellectual side of what it means to be human that is personally, intellectually, and passionately gratifying as you move through, move through life. So I'm going to tell you about my life with my oldest girlfriend. Uh, Lucy, and uh, show you some pictures of where she was found and, and why she is so important to, uh, for us to understand our roots and our origins. Um, as I said, I've had the great uh, privilege of working in Africa uh, since the uh, early uh, 1970s, uh, predominantly in Ethiopia, but also in Kenya and Tanzania and Egypt and a little bit in uh, uh, South Africa, as well as places in the Middle East, uh, and had the great fortune of finding some of these important nuggets uh, in the fossilized record that help us better understand our place in nature. Here you see an illustration of three skulls. Uh, on the left, uh, you have the skull of, you have to get used to this tonight, Australopithecus. It's a tongue twister. Uh, it actually means southern ape. It's a bit of a misnomer. Not the best name, not one I would have chosen for, to designate these eight men, but it was the first name applied to a fossil human ancestor. That's your people already over there, too. Um, and um, we have a pretty good idea of the last four to perhaps six million years of the human career. We know that there were certain important landmarks along the way that have distinguished us and defined us as unique primates. Primates include apes and monkeys and humans and lemurs and lorises and those sorts of things. But we are unique in a number of features. And as you will see this evening, one of the seminal features, if not the cardinal feature of what allows us to be placed on the human family tree rather than the ape tree is not language, it's not big brains, but it's standing upright. And we know that the earliest ancestors, Australopithecus on the left, were upright walking, the way that most of us came into the room tonight. Uh, and this was a distinction 
that happened at least six million years ago to a creature that was really the ape that stood up. You see the skull on the left, which has a very low forehead, a very projecting large face, a brain about 400 cubic centimeters, an average brain in this room would be about 1,300, 1,400 cubic centimeters. So our brains are more than four times or three times the size of early Australopithecus. That was an event that happened in Africa. We also see the first appearance of our own genus. We all uh, belong to the genus Homo, which is Latin for man, uh, in its broadest sense, uh, meaning mankind. Uh, and in the middle you see something called Homo erectus, or Homo ergaster, as it's known in Africa. And this was uh, a, a first event in Africa. And thirdly, on the right, you see a skull that's pretty familiar uh, and should look like the skull of the person sitting next to you. If it doesn't, let me know. Um, but we all belong to the same species, Homo sapiens, a name given in the 18th century to designate us, all plants and all life is designated by two names. We, we are all designated by at least two names. I mean, I'm Don Johansson, there's Bill Smith or Carol Jones or someone out there, and you are all known by two names. Um, and a, a Swedish um, zoologist, a botanist actually, by the name of Linnaeus, uh, decided that all living forms needed a scientific name. He called us Homo, after the Latin for man, and sapiens, which means supposedly wise. So we are supposedly wise men, but if you read the paper as frequently as I do, I sometimes wonder if that's the best name for us. So this is more or less the broad outlines of the last four to six million years. And I wanted to start with one of the greatest misconceptions in human evolution, which um, all of us in this room have seen in one form or another, and that is this uh, uh, depiction of an inexorable walk through time. That you have a span of evolution that ranges from ape to angel. And why is a white European male considered to be the pinnacle of evolution in every one of these? Well, you know why. Because white European males draw these things and they think that they are the pinnacle of evolution. Um, it is, uh, it, nothing could be further uh, from the point, uh, from the truth. Uh, because there is no direction to evolution. Sometimes that makes people uncomfortable because they think that everything that evolution has done was to create us homo sapiens. But think about all of the other animals. What if I was a chimpanzee up there and, we were, and all of you out there were chimpanzees? You wouldn't believe this either, would you? You'd think that the evolution was designed specifically to evolve into chimpanzees. So it's really a personal perspective. But certainly, the idea of a straight march through time has been contradicted by the evidence that I'm going to show you tonight. It really is a tree, or sometimes even a bush of evolution, with many false starts. And you can see how much prejudice there is, and how much, uh, uh, how much misunderstanding there is in this. I mean, see how unhappy that monkey is there? We didn't come from monkeys, but. How unhappy that chimp is, getting a little happier, a little happier. Boy, he's so happy to be homo sapiens. So there seems to be implied in all of this that we don't really become uh, until we uh, ultimately become homo sapiens. Well, Charles Darwin, and I'm going to say a few things about Darwin tonight because this is a very important year. Uh, this is the 150th anniversary of the publication of Darwin's extraordinary book, uh, on the origin of species by means of natural selection. A book that revolutionized our thought about the universe, uh, the biological universe, a book that refocused everyone's ideas onto a natural or naturalistic explanation for how uh, life came to be on this planet, and in many ways flew in the face of a more dogmatic and religious view that was so prevalent in the 1800s in England. It is also the 200th anniversary of his birth uh, that we're celebrating this year. Um, interestingly, he was born on Fe February 12th. We also had a very famous American born on February 12th. His name was Abraham Lincoln. And uh, they never, I think, knew one another. I don't think they ever corresponded with one another. But should they have come together 
they would have had a lot to talk about. Uh, because one of the things that Darwin was so fervent about, uh, and in fact, as, was his, as were his in-laws, he married his first cousin, which we know we shouldn't do. Um, and he did have kind of crazy kids. But um, he was an anti-slavery, very outspoken uh, anti-slavery person, just like Lincoln was. So uh, in England, he fought fervently against the idea of slavery. Uh, and this is something that he and Lincoln would have shared notes on uh, very well. Um, Darwin proposed uh, in his origin, we'll shorten the title, that all life forms had gone through evolutionary change over time. That not all creatures were created as we see them today, but that they had ancestors that looked different. That there were many lines or branches on the human family tree that went extinct. That there were no guarantees in evolution. In fact, that extinction was much more typical of the, of, of the tree of life than was survival. Um, one of the things uh, about Darwin that is interesting is that so many people say that he was anti-religious. He was not anti-religious. None of us are anti-religious as, as biologists. Uh, religion is a personal belief uh, that people carry as to how things were created. Um, but they thought this because everyone said, well, he, he attacked the idea of the church and said that humans evolved. Well, he didn't say anything about human evolution in his book until the sixth edition of his book. And he waited till the third to the last paragraph of his talk. And in a very understated, typical Darwin way, he wrote, light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. So he was very reticent to say too much. He didn't want to be a provocateur. He didn't want to put himself in the limelight of controversy. And uh, yet the ideas that he articulated in the origin inexorably, of course, would fall on an explanation for the origins of humankind. Now bear in mind, in 1859, uh, when he published that in 1863, when Thomas Henry Huxley, that first book I read as a, as a kid that got me interested in uh, the evolution of uh, humans, uh, all they had was a Neanderthal skull that had been found in 1856 in Germany. Nothing had been found in Africa. Most people at that time accepted the view, and again, this is because they were all European scientists, that they accepted a Eurocentric view, that Europe was the finishing school. That's where we really became human. It wasn't in some backwater area, like South, but like Africa, for example. And um, in 1863, Thomas Henry Huxley wrote, it is quite certain that the ape, which most nearly approaches man in the totality of its organization, is either the chimpanzee or the gorilla. And you can see little outlines there of uh, human and ape skeletons, and you can see that there is a, a striking resemblance between them. The differences being related really to locomotion, that we walk most of the time on two legs, uh, and uh, they walk on four legs. To Darwin and Huxley, this meant that they had a common ancestor. The reason that animals look like the reason that dogs and wolves look alike is because they had a common ancestor, not because they developed these features independently. We look like the African apes because we had a common ancestor with them. And Darwin, in his next major opus, which was published in 1871, called The Descent of Man, wrote, in each great region of the world, the living mammals are closely related to the extinct species of the same region. And he, there, and he said, it is therefore probable that Africa was formerly inhabited by extinct apes closely allied to the gorilla and the chimpanzee. But then he made the giant leap and said, and as these two species are now man's nearest allies, it is somewhat more probable that our early progenitors lived on the African continent than elsewhere. 
This is one of the aspects of the theory of evolution. And what we mean by theory is an explanation that is so profound, so robust, so explanatory, that one can use it to make predictions, like the theory of gravity, for example, that allows people to get satellites into orbit, that allows us to get the Mars rover onto Mars. And it's just the same with any theory such as the theory of evolution. You can make a prediction, and that prediction can be tested with discoveries. So in the light of a Eurocentric view of the origins of humankind, Darwin and Huxley in the late 1800s decided that Africa was the place because that's where our closest living relatives were to be found. And they thought, and as Darwin suggested, Africa, the dark continent as it was called because so little was known about it, was the place where people should look for fossils. These predictions were made way back in 1863, 1871. And it was predicated to, as you, as you know, to a large extent, on the similarities between us and the apes. We now know from the work of Jane Goodall, uh, who has the longest uh, uh, enduring field study of primates in the wild, the chimpanzees not only have a resemblance to us, or we have a resemblance to them, but they act a lot like us, or we act a lot like them. They share a lot of the same emotions of disappointment, despair, uh, of fear, um, of unhappiness, and so forth, of joy and pleasure, and so on, as humans do. There's a range of emotions that we see, not as sophisticated and developed and elaborated as among ourselves, but certainly features that identify us with them. Uh, we know that biologically they're very similar to us in their uh, bone structure. We know now from the DNA projects, uh, the genome project. I was just in at the National Institutes of Health uh, for Francis Collins, a friend of mine, the man who sequenced the human genome. Um, we talked a lot about this at this conference, that people have now sequenced the chimpanzee genome. And there's about 99% identity. So it means that that identity was not individually, independently evolved. It was something that was evolved from a common ancestor. And uh, today, there is no question that these two creatures are not related to one another. I see you recognize them. Well, in 1924, uh, this cheerful guy down here, um, Raymond Dart was an anatomist at the University of Witwatersrand, that's a mouthful, in South Africa. I was just in South Africa for in November and saw this specimen for the umpteenth time. A little baby skull that was found in 1925, or 24, and was published in 1925 as Australopithecus Africanus, as the South African uh, uh, ape man. And uh, apparently from the structure of the base of the skull where the spinal cord comes out, Dart could tell that it walked upright like all of us. So therefore, it belonged on the human family tree. But it had, even at the age of four years old when it died, a very small brain, a somewhat projected face, uh, as you can see here, and that he called it something we as scientists don't like to use, but he called it the missing link. And what people mean by a link is something that has features of its ancestry and something that has features of its descendants. So the features of the descendants were upright walking, and the features of the ancestors were small brain. And this was essentially the launch of paleoanthropology in Africa, the launch of looking for early human ancestors, and most importantly, in 1924, it was the vindication of those prescient words of Darwin and Huxley that Africa would prove ultimately to be the crucible, the cradle of humankind. Southern Africa dominated our interest and uh, discoveries of human evolution until 1959, as I said, when I was a 16-year-old, and the late Lewis and Mary Leakey picture there found this large skull 
at Old Divide Gorge. How many in the audience have been to Old Divide Gorge? Has anybody in here been to Old Divide Gorge? No, there's a hand right there, a couple of hands. See, people have been there. Uh, and you can go there. It's a fabulous uh, thing to do. It's one of the things you should put on your wish list in life. <coughs> Going to Africa. It's always great to go home. You know? When you go to Africa, you have a sense that you've been there before, which your ancestors have been. And you go on safari and see fabulous animals, and uh, lions, and leopards, and cheetahs, and giraffes. And you can walk to Old Divai Gorge, walk down into Old Divai Gorge in the Great Rift Valley of Tanzania, where Lewis and Mary Leakey made this discovery, and see the spot where paleoanthropology got its initial spark in Eastern Africa. The Rift Valley is additionally one of the most beautiful geological structures on the face of the earth. It is the result of a tectonic tug of war. The chunk of Africa is pretty stable, but the horn of Africa is slowly moving away. And you can take a beam like this little laser pointer that I'm using, but they have big powerful ones, and they can shoot them across these large valleys in Ethiopia or northern Kenya, and it's moving about two centimeters a year away from Africa. So this tectonic tug of war has developed this uh, almost uh, dueling scar in the face of the earth called the Great Rift Valley, where you see lakes and rivers uh, and the escarpment here, extinct volcanoes in the background. And this has become uh, a very important uh, natural laboratory for schol scholars like myself and others to find remains, fossilized remains of very ancient human ancestors who were kind enough to fall into these lakes and become part of the fossil record. <laughs> Someone asked me what I wanted to do with, when I died, what happened to my body? Well, I don't think I want to be thrown in the lake and become fossilized, but I do have plans to be skeletonized and put in my laboratory in a little box next to the Lucy skeleton. <laughs> but as macabre as that may sound, uh, here is the Great Rift Valley. It runs from Mozambique in the south up through Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia, that's charming, and um, that may be me causing that. Uh, and this is a very obvious geological structure. It's of utmost support to geologists because it really is a place to study continental drift. Remember there was some strange guy back in the early 20th century uh, who said that the continents moved about and they all thought he was nuts. Well, they have moved around. They were in different places, and they're moving as we're sitting here right now, slowly for the moment. Uh, and I know what that means in California. Uh, so that uh, this is a place where geologists can study rifting and continental drift. Uh, so it's also a great interest to uh, geologists. We're going to talk about uh, a site known as Hadar, which is a local place name. Uh, they're Afar. Uh, Muslim tribesmen who live in this area. This is their local name for this spot where uh, Lucy was found. And it's up in the broadest reaches of the Great Rift Valley in an area which is appropriately named after those people and called the Afar Triangle. Uh, this is what the landscape looks like. Uh, you see my camp just here, right along the edge of a large uh, riverine forest. There's a River called the Awash River, which flows through here. Otherwise, it would be virtually impossible to have teams of 30 and 40 people out there for three months. Water is a limiting factor. But uh, we camped by this river. Uh, my students and scientific colleagues from around the world work in multi interdisciplinary groups geologists, paleontologists, archaeologists, anthropologists, palynologists, people who study fossil pollen, for example. Um, and this is where we camp at Camp Hadar for up to two to three months a year to systematically search through those geological layers for fossils that are eroding out. Here you see uh, one of our teams uh, in the field. We normally go October, November into December. Uh, as I said, it is an international multidisciplinary group. Uh, it is a very remote spot, a very difficult spot. Uh, to work in. Uh, it's as hot as it is here, or where I live, in, in uh, outside of Phoenix, where during the summer we get 105 degrees every day in June, 
well, July and August and September. Uh, so this is a very hot and harsh place. There aren't any 7-Elevens nearby. We get a nice ice cold Coca-Cola or something. Um, we don't have refrigeration, so our meat is usually on the hoof. We buy a dozen goats, for example. As the season goes along, there's 11 and 10 and 9 and so on. And um, this is a group of very dedicated people who uh, are interested in pursuing the scientific explanation and the scientific evidence for uh, how we have uh, become uh, the dominant species on the planet, looking for the earliest, most ancient remains. There are, as I said in that picture, archaeologists and paleontologists and anthropologists and geologists, as well as a group of local people, it's hard to see from here, but you can see an AK-47 there, they all have Kalashnikovs. Uh, there's a tribe across the river that likes sometimes to wake us up in the morning with a little spray of machine gun fire over the tents. Uh, they do it just to let us know they're there. They're not doing it to shoot us or kill us. But uh, we have people who guard our camp and look after us, so it is physically a dangerous area to work in. And many of these people, uh, all the local people, are uh, Islamic. Uh, these are Muslim people uh, who pray five times a day who read from the Quran every day, uh, who um, are as religious as you can imagine. And I was asked uh, at a presentation I did a couple of weeks ago in Seattle, well, how do these people reconcile what you're doing with what they're reading in the Quran? And it's an important lesson for all of us, I think, that, that they have an open enough appreciation of the world to move into their own belief system. Uh, the, the, the origins, evolution of humankind in a way that is consistent with their ideas. For example, in the Quran, there's not very much room for uh, evolution. Uh, I, don't, I did give a lecture on human evolution in Tehran six years ago in Iran, if you can imagine. Um, but they believe that Lucy was the first human. And they believe that the first human was therefore an Afar person. And therefore, all humans are descended from their tribe. And that makes them comfortable with the idea of science, which is, I think, an important lesson for all of us. Um, the area that, the reason I was attracted to this area, I'm reminded right now of the last words of the captain in the Hindenburg. Is it hot in here, or is it just me? Um, who's more? I'm going to take my jacket off. Um, one of the things that attracted me to Hadar on the first visit in the spring of 1972 was the abundance of fossils, the density of fossil remains. Uh, this, uh, these deposits are extraordinarily fossil rich. Here you see a virtually complete elephant, just eroding out of a sandstone where it had fallen and died 3.4 million years ago. We've got elephants and rhinos and monkeys and gazelles antelopes, baboons, rodents, tiny little microscopic things. We've got a diversity of fossil animals associated with the hominid fossils that suggest to us that unlike the desert it is today, this is pretty much what it looked like uh, during Lucy's time. It was much more forested with a mosaic set of um, uh, environments. So don't try to read the fine print here. You'll just have to accept this unless you've got better vision than I do. This is, looks like a layer cake. Looks like the thing that mom makes in the kitchen. And the layers at the bottom, the first layer of the layer cake, are the oldest, and the ones at the top are the youngest, maybe only by a couple of minutes or so when you're making a cake. But this is a geological column. And what it does for us is it allows us to use uh, the dating of various volcanic horizons. There's one here, 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 and here. And the bottom one's dated at 3.42 million years, and uh, the top one at about 2.4 million years. So the oldest are at the bottom and the youngest are at the top. These are volcanic argon dates on eruptions. And uh, what you saw flying in there is the exact layer where Lucy was found. She's called AL-288, that's her field number. And she's just on top of a volcanic ash that's dated at 3,200,000 years. 
and someone said, well, you know, how accurate is this argon dating? Well, it's accurate to probably plus or minus 10,000 years, which is pretty darn good uh, when you look at it. So this allows us to put the fossils into a dated framework and to understand the relations between them. It allows us to look at the ages in which they live and how they relate to other sites in Africa. Uh, well, how do you find these things? Uh, there's no sign that says, you know, Lucy lived here, did here. Uh, and the, the area is hundreds of square mile kilometers. Um, this is just to give you a perspective. And the only way to do that is what you see me doing in this picture, is to constantly walk the landscape and systematically search for fragments that have eroded out of these geological strata. It's like driving through a road cut. Many of you on the highway have driven by a road cut that's been made to put the highway through there, and you look off to the side and there are layers. And in some places, you will see artifacts or potsherds or even fossils eroding out of them. And you know that the potsherds at the bottom or the fossils at the bottom are older than the ones at the top. So that's the only way you can find these, to look for these fragments of bone that are eroding out and hope to find them before the next rainstorm comes along and washes them away forever. This is the anonymous, undistinguished little hillside, right there, where on uh, November 24th, 1974, when I had just finished at the University of Chicago, I had the great fortune of finding the first fragment of Lucy's skeleton. I was searching, obviously, for human ancestors, and was walking back where you see these people gathered who are excavating, and didn't like me on that side. And uh, I glanced over my right shoulder as I was walking back to my Land Rover. It was a miserable noonday sun searing in the sky that was driving me back to camp so I could go for a swim in the river. And it was a little piece of elbow, just about two inches long, the bone that sticks out in your arm right there. And I knew from my my training and my understanding of bones and anatomy that it could only come from a human ancestor skeleton. It wasn't a monkey, it wasn't an antelope, it wasn't anything else. And it was the discovery of that little fragment of bone that you see just there uh, that led us to the skeleton. And uh, here you see a much thinner John uh, Johnson right there. And my graduate student, Tom Gray, who was with me at the time, he was on the left of me. Uh, and had I been talking to him at that very moment, I would have missed this fragment of bone. Uh, and what is even more astonishing is that skeleton was on the surface the year before, at least because we saw footprints of another member of our team within five feet of the skeleton who had missed it. Maybe because he or she was looking in the wrong direction. I think it was a geologist, and he was probably looking for rocks. <laughs> so we missed it. So, you know, we find what we're looking for, don't we? You lose the house keys, oh my God, I'm not gonna make the lecture, I can't find my keys. You're running around the house, you're looking for what? Keys. You don't remember all the other stuff. You know, that your kids haven't put away or you forgot to refile or whatever. You find what you're looking for and I carry this image of bones in my mind. This is a picture uh, taken uh, just a couple of weeks after the initial discovery of Lucy in 74, in December. Uh, Maurice Tayeb, the French geologist on the uh, right of this illustration, was the geologist who explored this area in 1968. And then in 1970, when I met him at a cocktail party in Paris, he told me about this area and invited me to come and explore it with him. And this is when we were first assembling the various fragments of Lucy. This is a, certainly an iconic image. It's an image that's in all of your introductory textbooks in anthropology, uh, in history books, in encyclopedias. Uh, it has become an icon in terms of human evolution. Uh, people know pretty much who you mean when you say Lucy. Uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting when you think about it because some people will be sitting around uh, at a lovely evening dinner and Somebody might say, boy, did you see that new skull that so-and-so found in East Africa today? It was on the front page of the newspaper. And someone says, oh, you know, that's, every year they find something that's so confusing and they've got all these names. I don't even, 
I don't, I, 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 and he said, well, you know, it's older than Lucy. And the guy goes, oh, older than Lucy. Well, it's like bringing up the name of a, of a relative or something, which would, funny way she is. And um, she, is the, she is the single fossil that has introduced so many people to this fascinating subject of trying to know something about our origins. And um, she has this uh, affectionate little name. I think if she was probably called, uh, what's a good name? Gudrun or something like that. She probably wouldn't have the kind of appeal that Lucy does. Uh, and uh, she, one has an idea in their mind and this is particularly the case when all the seventh graders study Lucy and they write me emails at the Institute. Oh, for extra credit, could you answer this question? And I'm doing a paper on Lucy and you. And my teacher said I could get extra credit. The most alarming one came in a few weeks ago when a student wrote in and said, if Dr. Johansson is still alive. <laughs> you know, most of us who find these things are ancient themselves. I'm getting there. And uh, she is what most people think of when they think of a human ancestor. They may not know exactly where she was found, may not know exactly who found her, or how old she was, but they know that there is a skeleton from somewhere in Africa that represents human evolution. Uh, she was named, I had a girlfriend on the expedition, uh, whose name was Pamela. And uh, Pamela and the rest of us were listening to a Beatles tape. Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds was playing. And Pamela said, well, why don't you call the skeleton Lucy if you think it's a female? And I thought, you know, I just finished my PhD at the University of Chicago. I said, I'm going some cute little name to my skeleton. It has to be some Australopithecus or something. But the name stuck. Uh, and the next morning, I was going back to the Lucy site, and we could find more Lucy's bones. How big do you think Lucy's brain was, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that's how we have come to know her. Uh, she is a female because of her very small stature. She's only uh, three and a half feet tall. We know she was not a child, that she was an adult, because her wisdom teeth have erupted. That's our third or last molar, and when that erupts in modern humans, it signals more or less the end of significant bone growth. So you are, in terms of biology, an adult at that point. Ask your parents if you're any wiser than you were when you were 12 years old. That's another question. Um, and her third molar, or wisdom teeth, had erupted, so we know she was a full adult. And also the bones had stopped growing. All of our bones grow in segments and their growth plates and so on. Um, so we knew that this was an individual of uh, small stature, uh, the length of the thigh bone here is about 12 inches. Just reach down and measure yours, right? Ours are significantly longer because we are very efficient bipeds, bipedal walkers that can walk long distances without tiring because we have a very long lever. Simple physics. Um, we had parts of the skull, but lamentably most of it had broken up, scattered, and was distributed and lost forever but enough from the curvature of the back of the skull on the side to tell us she had a brain about the size of a grapefruit, about 400 cubic centimeters. Um, we have parts of the backbone. There is some patterning in the lower part of the uh, backbone that's called Schurman's disease, which is associated with upright walking. It doesn't happen in apes, only in primates who walk upright. The only ones we know who walk upright are our own species. Uh, we had a pelvis, and we could mirror image that pelvis, so we knew that the thing you're all sitting on right now was adapted for upright walking, not for quadrupedal walking. And we saw those features also in the knee and the ankle and so on. And comparing the length of the arm bones with the lower limb, uh, this upper arm bone is significantly longer than what you would typically think of when compared with the thigh bone. Or, better said, the thigh bone is relatively short in Lucy. It's taken three and a half million years or so. It didn't take that long. It took another two million years before we got bodies of modern proportions like our own. Uh, so she began to tell us a lot of things. She was 3.2 million years old. At that time, you could fit every fossil older than three million years in the polyurethane. We knew nothing about what was happening older than three million years ago. 
She has become a, um, a, a touchstone, a benchmark by which we judge other fossil discoveries. She is uh, remarkably important in her own country, in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is proud to call itself the cradle of humankind, not only because of Lucy, but because of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other fossils. And they commemorated her discovery in a silver coin. This is a coffee bean on one side. Why a coffee bean? Because that's where coffee is from. It's from Ethiopia, from a province in Ethiopia, interestingly called Kaffa. And that's why we call it coffee. And on the other side is a uh, depiction of the 3.2 million year old skeleton, which in Amharic, which is the national language, they call Dinkanesh means uh, you are wonderful or you are beautiful. And uh, this was minted uh, two years ago during the Ethiopian millennium. I had the distinction, I know I don't look that old, but I've had the distinction of celebrating two millennia celebrations, one in our part of the world in 2000 and one in Ethiopia in 2007. Their calendar is seven years behind us because it's a Coptic Christian calendar. So they're very proud of Lucy. Uh, in Ethiopia, and in fact, she is known mostly by Lucy rather than Dinkanesh. There are Lucy bars and Lucy clubs and a Lucy magazine and a Lucy soccer match in Addis Ababa. People name their kids Lucy, uh, for example. And here you see the three mowers. There's one, two, three, close up of her lower jaw. The other thing that Lucy showed us that was so important was that idea of the walk through time that all of a sudden you become human. Uh, that, that not only is that wrong because it's a straight line, but because we don't all change all at once from an ape to a human. That in fact, Darwin's book predicted that different parts of the body would change at different rates. It's called mosaic evolution. And if you look at uh, Lucy in the middle, and you look at a chimp and a modern human on the left here, you can see that in terms of the cranium or the skull, we, Lucy still had a very small brain, like chimpanzees, a projecting face, uh, as opposed to our large brain, a flat face. But her pelvis was very similar to our own. That if you got this on an exam, you wouldn't have to be a PhD from the University of Chicago in anthropology to say that Lucy's pelvis more closely resembles a human or an animal. So it means that natural selection, the core idea, change over time uh, that Darwin suggested targeted different parts of the body. We stood up first before we grew large brains. So she told us about the sequence of evolutionary change. And here is uh, this example I was trying to tell you about the length of arms. Uh, we have a very relatively a very long thigh bone and a relatively very short arm bone because we don't use our arms for getting around very often, do we? We use our legs. Chimpanzees that use their forelimbs, which now become our upper limbs, in climbing and knuckle walking all the time, have equally long upper and lower limb. And Lucy was in between. So she's one of those bridge fossils. She's one of an intermediate type that had a whole bunch of eight characters in the skull and face, cranial capacity, and in the postcranial skeleton but did possess the cardinal feature of her descendants, which was upright walking. So I don't like to call her a missing link, but she fits that sort of role. She is an intermediate fossil, the kinds of things that are so hard to find in the fossil record. So here uh, is an x-ray of all of us walking along with very long lever arms, so we have a very efficient mode of locomotion when we walk. We walk with great ease, we burn up less calories per distance than does a quadruped, and certainly Lucy with her shorter legs, relatively shorter legs, was not as efficient probably a locomotor as we are today. We also know that they walk upright because astonishingly, one of, the, one of the great wonders of the ancient world was found in northern Tanzania. This is a layer of volcanic ash that came out of a volcano 3.6 million years ago in a major eruption. I don't know if any of you were in Washington, the state of Washington, when Mount St. Helens erupted. But you probably saw pictures in your newspaper of the snow-like covering of the ash on people's cars where they would write, you know, wash me, 
or write their name in it or a heart with their initials of themselves and their loved one. And it was just like that 3.6 million years ago in Tanzania at a site where Lucy's relatives, Australopithecus aparensis, as she is called, named after the Apar region, were living in what is today Tanzania. And very soon after that eruption and the kind of snowfall, there was a light rain and it became muddy. And at least two, probably two ancestors walked across there and left imprints. They weren't wearing shoes in those days, right? So you could see the footprints that looked like the footprints that you left when you were on spring break walking on the beach of somewhere in Mexico. Or so we have an idea of the soft tissue. So we know that not only were they upright from the bones, but we know this from the soft anatomy. What a remarkable discovery. Uh, the Ethiopian government issued uh, in 86 a commemorative stamp uh, with Dinkanesh on it. And as I said, there are lots of, here's Lucy College, Diradawa, named after Lucy. Here's one of the Afar tribesmen with his machine gun across his shoulders. I don't exactly know what class he might be going to. <laughs> this is the most astonishing a reference to Lucy, a student brought it in a few years ago. You know, you get Tazo tea of various kinds at Starbucks. And it says, African red bush tea. And it says, I can barely read it. Some say all humans have descended from a single African primate called Lucy. If this is true, she probably liked taking a break from the kids and drinking a soothing cup of red bush tea. <laughs> So, you know what, Lucy, they're talking about. This is my favorite. Here's a paleo cocktail party. She's being introduced. I'm not the least. Um, as I was saying earlier to uh, a local uh, reporter, that our work was interrupted in Ethiopia. I remember the road to success is always under construction. And uh, in the late 1970s, a very repressive uh, and aggressive communist regime took over Ethiopia and we were pretty much forced to give up uh, our expeditions to these, especially these remote areas. It was very dangerous. Uh, there were skirmishes everywhere. There were thousands, tens of thousands of people, people killed. And it was just impossible for us to work there. So we had to take a 10 year interruption in our work. And I worked uh, mostly in Tanzania. But um, in 1990, the uh, Ethiopian government uh, invited expeditions to return, to reinitiate field work. And remember, we had a number of problems. We had no skull of Lucy, right? And each and every one of you recognizes each other by your skull, by your face. Not by what your calf is shaped like or your foot or something, but you, you, you know Jim or Frank or Mary or Alice by what they look like. So the most distinguishing features in our bodies, except for your government, are in the face. Right? Neck down easily. But uh, we recognize each other by cranial features. And that's the same thing with fossil species of human ancestors. There's a whole bunch of them, as you will see. And one of the most diagnostic parts of the body was missing. The other thing that um, we didn't know was really how old Lucy was. We knew she was older than three million, but those detailed dates I showed you earlier came through geological refinement in the 1990s. So there were lots of problems hanging over from uh, the 1970s. So here is an extraordinarily complete skeleton, a skull that uh, has not been published in the scientific literature, but I wanted to share it with you tonight. I will be, we will be completing the article on this over the summer and publishing it hopefully sometime early next year. This is a female skull, uh, about 3.1 million years, about 100,000 years younger than Lucy, but the same species. So we know what a female skull looks like. And we've also been fortunate in finding a male skull of Lucy's species, a real brute, massive face. Um, it, it solidified our idea that the range of variation in size that we saw, and by the way, you know, people think, oh, well, I've got one specimen, you know, this, we now have 300, close to 380 specimens of this species from the side of The single most complete and extensive collection of a fossil hominid species until you get to Neanderthals. 
So very important. Uh, we had suggested that the larger size individuals were males and the smaller ones were females. Some people thought they were two different species. Now we have a male's jaw and a female's jaw. And uh, in terms of the anatomy, in terms of the relationship between face and cranium and the base of the skull and so on, there are variations on a single thing. So we know that males were much larger than females and this does represent a single species. The other thing that we know now that is very important is that these ancestors evolved and lived in more forested environments. We have a view from watching National Geographic, uh, Discovery Channel, and so on, that our ancestors lived out in open grasslands. Uh, and it appears that all these early, early species on the family tree lived in much more forested environments, lived with lots of available fruiting trees, the teeth, particularly the relationship of the large anterior teeth to the crushing and grinding teeth in the back suggests that they were essentially fruitivores. They lived mostly on fruits. So we have a common ancestor for apes and humans in Africa. We have the first upright walking in Africa. Now we have the first evidence of our own genus, and we have the first evidence of stone tools in Africa. Africa leads the way. And uh, we see the appearance of large brain up to twice the size of Lucy's, 800 cubic centimeters in Africa uh, at about a million and a half years ago. We see much larger bodies, bodies that are up to six feet tall, that uh, have modern proportions. And you can see how long the lower limb is relative to the shorter upper limb. And we see these as the first humans to leave Africa at about 1.7 million years ago. When we first picked them up in, the, in, 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 uh, in Georgia, the former Soviet Republic that lies between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. So they got out of Africa very early, evolved into Peking, Java Man, Homo erectus. And they did that long before we mastered fire, long before we developed sophisticated tools. And the tools that are found with these uh, with these species, Homo erectus, Homo ergaster, are simple pebble tools or scrapers or flakes that leave telltale cut marks on bones that indicate that the first exploitation of meat as an important part of the diet was again Africa. And it was the launching of our most successful adaptation ever, hunter gatherer. Up to 12,000 years ago when we saw the agricultural revolution, all populations around the globe, those in North America, Siberia, South America, Africa, Europe, Asia, were hunter-gatherers. There is a view, of course, as I said at the beginning, that Europe was a finishing school. If you're going to be a respectable human being, you've got to be a white European. That's where we became who we are. And it is my sense that discoveries that we're beginning to make, and I say we, because we, I have a colleague at my institute, Curtis Marion, who is working in Southern Africa, at the tip of Africa, just east of Cape Town. Another place you want to put on your list of places to visit. In fact, and they are finding sophisticated bone tools, and you might think, well, these awls and needles and borers and so on, they're very hard to make. It's easier to make a stone tool. These don't show up in Europe until 40,000 years ago. Yet in South Africa, they're found at 70 and 80,000 years. The use of ochre, okay, an iron-rich uh, clay that you can wet and you can use like the lipstick that's in so many of your handbags to decorate yourself as you do. And this goes back to 160,000 years. There are 70,000-year-old ochre engraved plaques of ochre that probably were wetted and used as body sticks to identify clans with each other. So my view is that Europe was not the finishing school, that Africa was the place where even modernity evolved. The oldest Homo sapiens skulls are now 200,000 years old in Africa. We show up 40,000 years ago in Europe, when Neanderthals have been living there for a couple hundred thousand years. So my view is that that's more of what a first European looked like fairly darkly pink, not the light skin that we are so supposedly comfortable with. This is not meant to test your eye vision. It's meant to just show you the diversity 
on the human family tree. When I published my first book, Lucy, in 1981, there were a half a dozen or so. We now have up to 10 new species. It means that the tree is filled with branches. But what is so interesting about this tree is that no matter where you grasp one of the branches, the roots all lead back to Africa. And that's the take home message in a diagram like this. Most of them went extinct, as you can see, except for that single species on the upper right that evolved into us. Lucy, still at the pivotal point on the family tree, between very ancient ape like creatures and much more change derived from modern. Well, I'm going to conclude with a, a quote from uh, Pliny the Elder, uh, who you may know he died in, we know he died in 79 AD. He was asphyxiated in uh, Naples uh, because of the eruption of Vesuvius. He was out to rescue some friends and he died. Uh, but he wrote, Ex Africa, Aliquid, uh, Sempre Aliquid Novi, always something new out of Africa. And one of the most extraordinary things that has uh, uh, appeared recently is a discovery by an Ethiopian colleague of mine, what a wonderful name, huh? Zerai, Zeresinai, Alan Sagan, we call him Zerai. He is a, grew up in um, Aksum, in the northern part of Ethiopia. He is a native Ethiopian. He um, got interested in archaeology as a young kid because people were there digging up things. Oxum is an interesting place. There's supposed to be fragments of the Ark of the Covenant being carefully guarded by the uh, Coptic Christian priests who never let you have a look at it. And um, he, this photograph, that little green over there is the river we saw earlier, and over there is where Lucy was found, way, way in the distance. And he's working in an area known as Dikika, south of where Lucy was found. And uh, he has found in slightly older sediments, the sediments go back almost to 3.6 million. Hadar goes back to about 3.4. But in a layer at about 3.3 million years, when he was a, uh, a postdoctoral student at my institute, uh, he came back with a complete child skull, 3.3 million years old. Uh, you can see the crenulations of the brain up here, that sandstone that's filled the inside of the brain case and molded itself to the inside of the brain case that's molded on top of our brains with all the granulations. You can see that the lower jaw is still in contact with the upper jaw. Uh, it was uh, highlighted in a past National Geographic uh, issue. Here you see it, uh, the baby on a bad hair day on the cover. And uh, it was found just south, just south of where Lucy was found by about four kilometers. And um, it represents now the oldest, most complete specimen of Australopithecus operatus. Uh, we knew there were hominid fossils there because I did explore that region very briefly in 1974 when uh, we waded across the Alawash River. So up here is where Lucy was found, here's where the baby was found. We waded across the Alawash River local off our guys have put a curse on the river so the crops wouldn't bother us. We waited across the water like this. I counted the minutes and the seconds, I guess. And uh, we found uh, human jaws and things on that side of the river. But it took Zerai, uh, Zerai's work to find this. And it's an extraordinary specimen. We'll be hearing lots and lots about it because it was about three years old when it died. It appears that, it was, that on the basis of the dental pattern of eruption, it was maturing much more rapidly than us. We mature very slowly, as all parents know. We have long extended infancies, long extended childhoods, as opposed to all other animals. Why? Because we live in extraordinary complex worlds. We need to learn a lot before we can interact and become a member of this complex society called human society. Um, and this uh, obviously developed much more rapidly than a chimp pattern. We know that it was a female baby, which is astonishing, because they've done a CAT scan and measured the adult teeth in the upper parts of the jaw that are just beginning to develop. And the size of the canine is small, the adult canine, which would be a female rather than a male. So a, a 
female, a baby girl who died 3.3 million years ago. The kind of baby Lucy would have had, not identical, I mean not Lucy's baby, because Lucy was 3.2 million, but this is going to allow us to look into, as I say in one of the chapters of my book, growing up Australopithecus. How does a baby grow up into an adult? And that's going to give us key insight into the kind of maturation sequences that they went through, how they matured, how quickly that was, and so forth and so on. Well, um, I'm going to conclude by saying that, you know, what is the legacy that Lucy has left us? I've entitled my new book, uh, Lucy's Legacy. Uh, the legacy that she has left us is, I think, profoundly important on two fronts. One is that we, like all other life on this planet, are part of the natural process called evolution. That we are a product of the very natural world that we are taking from, we are polluting, and we are destroying. And to think that the natural world, through the process of natural selection, over eons of time was responsible for us, and yet we are turning our back on the very process, the very world that created us. There's an important message there. Ultimately, Mother Nature will have its revenge. We are at the pinnacle of the evolutionary tree because we are the brightest, the most influential, the most passionate, the most destructive, at the same time the most creative. I hope that egocentricness, as I sometimes call us, will spend less time taking and more time giving, not just to the natural world, but to each other. And the other legacy that Lucy gives us is a very important one for who we are today, living in a world that is dominated by strife in the Middle East, in Africa, in Afghanistan, Iraq, South America, Mexico, so many places. We are all the same species. We all belong to Homo sapiens. We all have a common ancestor. We all have a common beginning. We are united by our past. And it seems to me that if the species is going to continue, we have to realize that we as a species have this common ancestry. We are a common species today. We have a common destiny. And let us hope that we will make the right decisions so that we will leave descendants who will someday look back on their ancestors. Thank you very much.